I was living in one of the suburbs, and I got orders to Lemoore, California. And if you want to know what Lemoore, California looks like, it's just south of Fresno, and it's a lot like West Texas, just not as nice. Um, <laughs> And we thought it'd be good to like, hey, we're going to drive cross country. It'll be good for you to see Lemoore, where we're going to live. We'll start looking for a house. We're only a couple months from getting married and uh, see some family along the way. And so when you drive west out of the D.C. area, kind of skirt uh, southern Pennsylvania, northern Maryland. And then you, there's this area where you're going through West Virginia and then you hit Ohio. And we've been going about, I don't know, two, two and a half hours. And it was time to make a stop, right? Need some fuel. Uh, Heather needed to use the restroom, and so we get off the highway. And it was one of those rest, um, one of those exits off the highway where there's plenty there, right? There's options for food and a bunch of different um, gas stations. And um, as I'm exiting, remember, I'm a single man for 30 years at this time. As I'm exiting the highway, what criteria am I using to choose a gas station? Food. Price. What's the cheapest gas? Okay. What is my wife's criteria that she's looking at? at how clean is that bathroom? Okay. So, so I don't know this yet. I don't know this yet. So we get off the exit. I see the sign that has the lowest number on it. I pull in there and I pull up right next to the pump and I can feel her looking at me. And I'm like, I don't want to look. Because I know that feeling, it ain't good. And so I, I do this, like, hey, what's up, babe? And she says, you, I hope you do not expect me to go to the bathroom in here. And I was like, well, what's the problem? And I kind of look up, and it's one of those old gas stations where the door was on the outside, on the side, where you had to get a key, and it was, like, attached to a hubcap, <laughs> right? Because they thought you were going to run off with the bathroom key or something. I don't know. And, um, and, and I could have swore there was a guy in overalls with a banjo, like, right there. And I was like, I, I don't think we should stop here, babe. I, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> and so I, I paid more for gas that day <laughs> than I would have, and, and she was happy. And I, and I learned. But that was, that was the start, really, of a lot of change for me to learn um, what it is that my wife thought about the world and uh, how I needed to adapt to that. And I can tell you, I was happy to make adjustments and change for my wife, right? It took a lot of learning. I didn't always get it on the first time, but I was happy to make that change. You know when I'm not happy to make change? It was when it feels like it's forced on me, right? Well, like I don't have a choice, and like right now, if I take a step back culturally and what's going on in our world, I feel like a lot of change is coming that I am pushing back against. And I don't want to do that, and I don't think that's right. It's fine if my wife wants me to change, but the way culture wants me to change, the way culture wants me to think, I'm not down for that, right? And I'm feeling, I don't know if you feel this, I feel like I want to push back, right? The other thing I'm noticing, I don't know if this is true for you, I see it more and more, right? Where people used to be as they press into life and the new seasons and 2023 and whatever year it is, people generally used to be hopeful, optimistic, like, man, can't wait for this next year. This is going to be great. I'm having more conversations in the midst of all this change where people are less optimistic. I'm having more conversations where people will say something like this. This is not the world I grew up in. I have more people having conversations with me about, hey, pastor, I, what do I tell my kid about this, right? I'm getting texts from fathers whose sons and daughters are seeing stuff in school, and they're like, what do I tell my kid? They just asked me this question. And they're not asking, like, I really can't wait to have this conversation. They're like, I don't know what to say. And in the midst of what we're dealing with, right, what do you do? And as I think about that, my next question is, like, okay, God, what do you think about everything that I see? What do you think about what's going on? Right? Because he does see it all. Right? He doesn't just see all. He knows what's actually happening. He knows things that we can't see. And the second question I have is, like, okay, God, then what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? 
And I wonder, as I start to, like, okay, God, and I pray, and I'm like, what, how should I lead people? How am I going to lead my wife and my own family in the midst of everything that's going on? God, what would you say to me personally that I have to, like, feed into my family and my kids, and then as I lead in God's church? God, what's your point of view about what I see? And as I start to think about that, here's where I'm left with. Here's what I think is going on at some level. Like, here you and I, and we're looking at the world, and we can see what we can see. And we see changes coming, and we see all this stuff, some of which you just want to, like, it's crazy town. And here's what I think is possible, that we can come over here and look, so God, what do you see? What's your point of view? Because here's what I think God's heart is, that in the midst of whatever is happening in culture, right, God wants you and I to be hopeful. He wants us to be engaged. He wants us to be energized, not fearful, not pessimistic, not back on our heels. He wants us to be forward-leaning, but hopeful in Him, energized in Him, engaged in Him, hopeful in Him. So the question is, like, if you and I could sit down with God, God, what are you doing? And what, it is, what is it that you and I need to see from his point of view with what's going on? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Ezra. Middle of your Old Testament-ish. If you find First and Second Chronicles, keep going to the right. If you hit Esther or Nehemiah, Esther, back up to the left. We're going to be in Ezra chapter 1. And what I think God wants to tell us first off is that God is working in his world. That God foremost right now, as you and I wake up every day, that God is in fact working. He is working. So a little background on Ezra before we jump in there, just kind of situate us to where this book sits in the history of God's people. Um, <clears throat> The two nations, right? Northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. Um, they were supposed to obey God and follow God and worship God. And what happened is they get off into idolatry and sin. And they're like, yeah, we're going to worship Yahweh, but we're also going to worship this God in the land. We're going to worship over here. And God sends prophet after prophet and says, if you don't stop, I'm going I'm to punish you. I'm going to judge you. And over years, like years, it's like, I'm warning you, I'm warning you, I'm warning you. Eventually, the Assyrian Empire comes, takes the northern tribes, they get wiped off the map. It's a little better in the south in Judah because they had a couple kings along the way that did good and, and called people back to God. But sure enough, after a while, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians come and they get pulled into exile or killed. Jerusalem is wiped away. The temple is destroyed. God's like, I told you, and you're done. And what happens is, during that time, there's two prophets, Jeremiah and Ezekiel, who, who have a message of two things. To confirm for the people, hey, you want to know why this is happening? All the things that God's been telling you for a lot of years. But they also have a message of hope. Because although God, through Nebuchadnezzar, is carrying you away into exile... He's going to bring you back. Not only is God going to bring you back, He's going to give you faithful leaders. Not only is He going to give you faithful leaders, He's going to rebuild this temple. Not only is He going to rebuild this temple, His glory is going to return to the temple and you will worship Him again here. And as Ezekiel and Jeremiah finish their prophecy, the people are left in exile wondering, okay, when? And it goes quiet for 35 years as they wait for all those promises that those prophets delivered to say, okay, when's it coming? When's it coming? And Ezra is the answer to, well, what happened next? Because particularly with Ezekiel, Ezekiel ends and 35 years later, Ezekiel begins. So this is what we read in Ezekiel chapter 1 as we see God working in his world in this time. This is Ezra 1. It says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. Now here's what's going on. Cyrus is now the big dog on the block. 
He is the regional superpower. He is the king. No one can match him. Right? He is the head of the Medo-Persian Empire. They just wiped off the Babylonians. He's the big dog now. And what I find interesting in God's word, it says, in the first year. Now, I've never been a king. I don't plan to be one. Um, but in the first year, I don't know what I would be doing. Maybe if I'm Cyrus, I'm trying to put down any rebellions. Right? I just overtook some lands, some rebellions could pop up, I need to put that down. Maybe if I'm Cyrus in the first year, you know what I'm doing? I'm making sure my borders are secure. I just expanded my territory, I need to consolidate power, I'm just, that's what I'm doing. Maybe in my first year I sit down with my generals and I go, you know what? Here's where we're going next. We've got to take care of that nation, we've got we to conquer that land, maybe that's what I'm doing. Here's what's super interesting about what's happening in Ezra chapter 1. He does none of that. What he does is he cares about this little refugee community that he, that he inherited from Nebuchadnezzar. These people that are just over by the canal, down by the river, living in a van. <laughs> and Cyrus, think about this, he is, he's the biggest guy on the planet, humanly speaking, and he takes note of these refugees over here. Why is that? Well, God, God's word tells us. Two things. God was working. Why? Because he said he was going to work for them. And this is now the mechanism of how he's going to bring his people back to the land. And it says he moved his heart. Um, every time you're frustrated by the way elections go in our country, I want you to read the verse, Proverbs 21.1, where it talks about every leader in every office, his heart or her heart is in the hand of the Lord and he just moves it whatever he wants. And this is an example of God doing that very thing. Why? Because God was working in his world. Now, imagine you're a refugee. You're one of the Jews in Babylon. Are you super excited that year, that January 1st, making my resolutions? We're totally going back home, I know it. <laughs> no, you know what you're doing after 35 years? I don't know if this is ever going to happen. Yeah, I heard about that thing Jeremiah said. I know what Ezekiel said. But we've been now here 35 years. Are you pumped up? Are you fired up about this new year? No, you're just trying to make it through another one. But what was true? Again, remember, if they could change their point of view and see things from the way God sees them, would they be hopeful? Yes. Yes, why? Because God was working. And he was working in ways that they couldn't even imagine. Like things that if you had told them, like on January 1st of that year, they'd be like, no way. No way has that happened. You mean Cyrus is going to hook us up? It gets better. Look at verse 2. This is what Cyrus puts in writing. It says, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Now, we don't know how God got that message to Cyrus. Maybe it was in a dream. Maybe it was some other way. I don't think he was reading the prophecies of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. That's possible. I don't think that's likely. But in any event, God can get a message to a pagan king. I don't think we're supposed to think that because of this, um, Cyrus is like, oh yeah, now I'm all in with Yahweh. Like, I don't think so. I don't, he, he's not a follower. He's more of an acknowledger. He's like, all right, yeah, I see you Jews. You got your own God. All right, yeah. I think your God spoke to me, so this is what I'm going to do for you. I think that's what's going on. It's not like he's going to go worship with them in Jerusalem. He's just trying to placate, if you will, this God who he thinks gave him the message. Verse 3. Anyone of his people among you, may his God be with him. Now he's addressing the Jews. And let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Now, at some level, I don't know about you, but if I'm Cyrus, I'm going to say 50% uh, of y'all can go back. All right, maybe, maybe two-thirds can go back. If I'm not feeling as generous that day, a third of you can go back. Why? Because I'm a brand new king in this area, and I got some projects I want to do, and I need some labor. You know what he just did? And if he, if he was from Texas, he would have said, all y'all can go back. That's what he would have said. That's amazing. Because you don't do that. 
Like, as a king, you got to make sure that your stuff is taken care of. you got to keep a little back, don't you? you got a lot of stuff you need built. You need, you need labor. And what does he say? All y'all can go. Why? Because God was working in the heart of Cyrus. Why? Because God is always working in his world in ways that if right now we could see it, blow your mind. Blow your mind. And it gets better. Look at verse 4. Here's part of this law that he's putting in writing. And the people of any place. Now he's going to talk to all the neighbors of the Jews. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living, that's Jewish survivors, are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. What's Cyrus saying? Hey, you guys are doing a building campaign. What I want you to do is get all the money from everyone else in town. So says the mayor. So says the county commissioner. What? Could you imagine if that happened today? That's what's happening here. Hey, um, God's house needs a, needs a remodel. And, er- and everyone else, you're paying for it. That's what he just said. Question. Is God working in our world today? A little bit or a lot? Do you think this blows their mind when they read this? When this gets posted, like whatever they, wherever they posted laws in Persia, right? They're like, say what? Here's what I think we're supposed to see. Again, if we could shift our point of view from how we, like, right? God knows we only have a certain vantage point. But what he invites us to is I want you to shift over here and try to see it from my perspective with the eyes of faith because God is always working in his world. Listen to this. This is what Jesus said in John chapter 5, uh, verse 17. Jesus said to them, my father is, check this out, always at his work to this very day. And then Jesus adds, and I too am working. John 5, 17. Uh, One of the things that in our culture right now that makes me the saddest and maddest at times is um, everything pertaining to abortion. And so last year I was pretty happy when the Supreme Court did what the Supreme Court did, right, in overturning Roe v. Wade. And then I got really sad when state after state um, that doesn't agree with that started to enshrine the best they could abortion in their states. And then I got even madder when companies said, hey, we will pay for you if you want to go get an abortion at such and such. And as I was kind of noodling on this, and like, okay, so what are we supposed to do with this? How are we supposed to lead our people? I I came across a podcast of uh, Chuck Colson. It was a recording of him because he's deceased from about a decade ago. And he was telling the story during the, during the mid-90s when, at that time, he and a bunch of other evangelicals were trying to get the partial birth abortion ban through Congress. And what happened was they got it through Congress, but the president at the time vetoed it, and there wasn't enough votes in the Senate to override the veto, so it failed. And Colson um, was obviously dejected by that, frustrated, all the rest. But he tells the story of in that time finding himself in the basement of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Now he's in St. Patrick's to witness a baptism because there's a small chapel in St. Patrick's there with a baptistry and there was a certain man getting baptized and that man was uh, Bernard Nathanson who was one of the most prolific abortionists in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, who had renounced his previous life, come to faith in Jesus, and was now getting baptized. And Colson tells the story as he's watching this man who was a Jew, like in the first century, who would come in the darkness to make his profession of faith to Jesus. He's like, I'm witnessing the first century. And he looks at this cross above where this man is getting baptized. And this is what Colson says. He says, as I reflected on the day when infanticide could not be stopped by the United States Senate, 
I realized I was witnessing this day the victory. I looked at the cross and I realized again that what the Gospel teaches is true. In Christ is always the victory. There at the altar was a man who spent three decades in the sinful world of abortion joyfully accepting forgiveness in Jesus. And there were 80 people huddled in the catacombs of St. Patrick's celebrating a victory that no one could veto. It is the triumph over the gospel, of the gospel over evil, God in Jesus changing hearts one by one. Remember, we win. Jesus has already secured the victory. That means we, regardless of what's going on in culture, can move forward, hopeful, engaged, energized, forward-leaning, ready to go. Why? Because God's at work. And if we could right now peel back like the curtain that veils our eyes to what he's doing, like it would blow our minds. You're like, no, he's doing that? Like in ways, like no one saw this man getting baptized except for 80 people. And yet God is changing hearts one by one. So here's the first application for us, right? Of all the things that torque us, that you're like, what's the one thing that if you could see God working in would change your demeanor? Like the one area, like God, if you could just work, whether it's personally, culturally, in your business, wherever it is, like God, could you be at work here? Answer, he probably is. Why? Why? Because the same way for Coulson, as he's just suffered this defeat naturally, he sees the work of God, and then he's hopeful again. He's like, wait a minute. Yeah, we lost there, but we win in the end. And with that, we move forward. What does that take? It takes a change of point of view. Because if we just see what's happening in the natural... Of course you'd be dejected. Of course you'd be down. Of course you'd be like, well, what's the point? But what God invites us to do is he says, would you come look at it from my point of view? And it's why he's given us books like Ezra. He's like, he did it for these people. Could he not do it again? So first truth, I think Ezra teaches us is that God is working in his world. The second is that God is working in people. Like God's working big picture, right? He's moving things in the world all over the place. But he's also working individually in people. Look at verse 5. It says, then, here's the response. So, so Cyrus gives this proclamation, and now we see some of the response. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, those were the southern tribes, and the priests and Levites, notice this, everyone whose heart God had moved. Now, don't miss this. Like, Ezra repeats this on purpose. He says, God moves the heart of Cyrus, but God's just not working there. God moves the heart of his people. God's working over here, big picture, and he's working over here in the hearts of his people. He says, everyone whose heart God had moved prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Here's what I'm here to tell you. God is working in your heart. If you know Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, he is working in your heart. More than you know. Some, Some inklings you have and some you don't. I'm here to encourage you. It's more than you think. Right? And the principle holds, right? If God is working big picture in the world more than we think, is it not possible that God is working in here more than we think? But here's a challenge with this passage, right? And here's what we need to guard against, right? What we can do is we can read Ezra chapter 1 and just put a little distance between us and this story. Why? 
Because, well, yeah, like I can see God worked in this time, in these people. They were exiles. They were refugees. But is he really working like that in my heart in this time? Answer, yes. But why is that hard sometimes to simply go, okay, he's working here now in this way in this time, and he's working in here. He's working in these people, and he's working in this people. Why? You know why that's hard? Because then we're accountable. We are responsible for our response. If God works in your heart, it isn't simply, yeah, I felt God tell me to do X, Y, Z. I'm going to hesitate and procrastinate, and then I'm going to forget about it. Hopefully he forgets about it too. Amen. <laughs> right? Tell me about it. I know I've done it. Haven't you done that? Like, I feel God leading me. I feel God calling me. I feel God, yeah, but God, that's going to be hard. And I don't know how that's going to go. And I've got other problems over here. And God's still working in your heart. And he invites us. He says, see what I could do. If you would say, okay, God, I believe you are leading me in this way. And I am going to take a step. And he's given us stories like Ezra to encourage us in that moment to go, all right, I will take a step. Because, like, this is going to blow your, like, are you reading your Bibles right now? (laughs) Look at verse 6. Look at what happens. All their neighbors, this is the neighbors of the Jews, assisted them with articles of silver and gold with goods and livestock and with valuable gifts in addition to all the free will offerings. How come you didn't fall out of your chair? <laughs> okay, let's paint the picture, right? You're a Jew in this time. Hey, Fred, yeah, Bill, yeah, down the street. Yeah, good to see you. Oh, yeah, this is great. Hey, how much gold you got? <laughs> You heard about the Cyrus thing, you know, the proclamation? Yeah. Um, Jew, going back, um, man, that's a nice goat. Take one of those. Man, what you got over there? Nice. Could you imagine what that was like? And they're going down the street with a wheelbarrow. What are you doing? Just taking an offering. Going back to Jerusalem. Now, if you had told them on January 1st of that year that they would be getting gold and silver and livestock from all their neighbors, like they would have said, are you kidding me? God's not doing What? And what happened? Is it possible? Is it possible that as God works in his people and they take a step of faith that he does more, like, it'll blow your mind. And you've experienced some of that, right? I got to talk to Leif and some other guys this weekend, right? The fact that this church is here is a miracle of God's grace. And the faithfulness and the prayerfulness of a group of people who say, we need this kind of church in San Saba. It's just Ezra 1 all over again. Why? Because God does this on repeat over and over and over again. And it gets better because Cyrus gets in on the gig. Look at verse 7. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah, And this was the inventory. Gold dishes, 30. Silver dishes, 1,000. Silver pans, gold gold bowls, matching silver bowls, other articles. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and silver. Sheshbazar brought all these along when the exiles came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. What's happening? God is good to his promise. He says, you think Nebuchadnezzar's in charge? You think I can just let Nebuchadnezzar ransack my temple? I'll bring that stuff back. And this is what he's doing. All of it. All of it comes back. You think, think, Cyrus, you're in charge? I'm in charge. You're the one I'm moving. 
Why? Because God's working in people. He's working in this people, the this people you look at in the mirror every morning, and he's working in the people around you. All the time. All the time. And God's inviting us to take a step. All those little thoughts, all those little nudges that you and I have had over the years where God is saying, take a step. And that's God moving your heart. That's God asking you, hey, do you want to get in on what I'm doing? And what he might could do. When I came on staff at uh, Hill Country Austin, um, <clears throat> the, the guy who preceded me after a few months left for a different church, so I took on all the church planting. You heard that in, in the bio. And as I'm getting into this new role, I sit down with Tim, and Tim and I are talking about, like, okay, here's what we've done for the previous, like, 20 years in the history of Hill Country, how we planted all these churches. And just so you know, like, our general methodology was not the San Saba model, like where we're just going to find a really great guy like Leaf and Liz and couple, and we're just going to send them off to San Saba. Um, what we did was we had a website, and we advertised, and we said, hey, if you want to plant a church in the Austin area, and you feel called of God, man, send us your resume. We'll interview you, assess you, put you through a, a, tr- a one-year training program, and then we'll help you launch your church. That's what we had done for about 20, 25 years. And so I'm sitting there with Tim, and he goes, okay, we're not doing that anymore. And I'm like, say what? <laughs> like, that, that kind of worked. Uh, we're doing all right with it. What do you mean we're not doing that no more? He's like, this is what we're going to do. Eric, here's your job. You have to figure out how we plant the next generation of churches and the only people you can recruit from are the people of Hill Country Bible Church. And I'm writing notes because I'm a good employee most of the time. And uh, I'm thinking in myself, no one's figured that out. Like we talk to churches like ours all over the country and um, no one's figured that out. Well, how do you do that? What do you do on day one? What do you do on day two? And like, and like, good, I'm a Marine, right? So it's like, yeah, I can do that, boss. No problem. And I walk out of there. I'm like, I have no idea, Lee. Like, what am I going to do? I've got no clue. And so what do you do in that situation? Okay, God, I need help. And within a couple months, I met Alex. Alex Hernandez, um, small business owner. He's got a remodeling company. He's from Columbia. He's like, hey, I feel like God's called me to plant a church for Spanish speakers in our area. I was like, do what now? (laughs) And so I discipled Alex. He started his church uh, last Easter. 300 people now. Mostly, mostly from like Venezuela, who are escaping that country, Colombia, South America, Central America. Going awesome. And then I meet Venu. Guess where Venu's from? He's from India, right? He works for Hewlett Packard. And I don't know if you've been down to Austin lately, but you can now find cricket fields in Austin because the, the tech industry, so many Indians are coming. Right now in Austin, you can count seven Hindu temples, two Indian churches. Venu and his wife, Sam, I meet them. Venu's like, well, Sam's the real firecracker. She's like, God's called us to plant a church. Venu's like, I'm with Sam. <laughs> which is, like, which is kind of like Heather, too. Heather needed to convince me that I was supposed to plant a church. Um, and so I discipled Venu last year, and now he's meeting with a group of Indians, some of which are Hindus currently. Amen. And I got to disciple and pour into James and Joseph, and there's a couple of young, good young guys that are probably three to five years out who are going to continue to be the next generation. Why? Why? I, I ain't that smart, right? Marines, we like crayons, right? Because um, God's working in his people, right? It kind of got thrust on me. Tim's like, hey, congratulations, this is what you need to figure out. I'm like, okay. Um, but he was working in me and he started working in all these other people. Where would you like to see God work? Like honestly, in the city, in the county, in your own life, 
in the lives that God has given you already, like where would you like to see God work? Here would, here would be my challenge and my encouragement. Take 30 minutes, take an hour this afternoon, maybe tomorrow over your quiet time with the Lord, and say, okay, God, I'm going to take you at your word. I read, I read Ezra 1 yesterday, and I hear you that you're working in here. You're not just working in people out there, you're working in this people here. What would you have me do? And listen, listen. If you're married, ask your spouse, what do you feel like God would have me do? Because you've probably been saying some things that your spouse has picked up on, but you've kind of just been talking, and they're like, well, you know what you should do? I'll tell you right now what you should do. Yeah, Amen. That's why you have a spouse, those of you that do. And see what he says. See what he says. I bet it'll blow your mind if you start taking steps in that direction. Here's the next, so in two weeks, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida, at like the, there's this big uh, church planting conference, and I'm actually going to speak on what we're doing at Hill Country with this thing that Tim forced me to do. <laughs> so, like, I can't, you can't make that up. I don't know how that happened. I bet he has that for you too. I bet he has that stuff for you too. Why? Because he's been doing it for centuries. This is 2,500 years ago. This is about 530 BC. <clears throat> God's working in the world right now. God's working in people. And by people, I mean this people. And this is the last thing we're going to say. God's inviting you to play your part. God's inviting you to play your part. Look at chapter 2. Now these are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town, in the company with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reeliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Baana. Now, I know this isn't true of you, but a lot of people skip these chapters in the Bible. Like, they see these lists of hard names, and they're like, flip. Other people do that. I know you don't. The list of the men of the people of Israel, the descendants of Perash, and you can see the numbers listed, of Shephatiah, of Era, of Pahath Moab, and you're wondering how many names are we going to read, of Elam, of Zatu, of Zakai, of Bani, and Bebai. And we'll stop there. Why is this list in your Bible? Do you ever think about that? Like, why is this list here? All right, just think about this for a second. Um, in your Bible, you'll find the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, like, quintessential sermon, right? And you'll find this list. Both made the book. Why? I'll give you a couple reasons. Um, one, to make the point that these were real people. They had real names. They had real marriages. They had real jobs. They had real houses. They had real kids. They had real problems. They had real struggles. They had real stuff that they were dealing with when Cyrus made his proclamation and this stuff started to happen. They were real people at a real time and they were no different than you and I. And the reason this list is in here is to show us once again that our God is paying attention. He's a God who makes lists. Question. Is this Ezra's book or God's book? book. Whose list then is it? Uh, ah, Ezra is just the guy that wrote it down. It's God's list. Why? Because he cares. Because he sees your life. He knows what you do in response to him. And he notes it. 
he notes it so much that he writes a list of all the people of this time who responded to how he was moving in their hearts. He goes, I see you. And he writes their name down. I see you. I was moving in your heart. I see you responded. I see. You know what I believe? I believe that there's a list. It says 2023, and it says Austin, and all the people in Austin that responded to the, to the moving of God. I believe there's a list, 2023, Cedar Park, and all the people in Cedar Park, that's where I live, um, who responded to the work of God. You know what else I believe? 2023, San Saba, is your name on the list? Would you like it to be? What do you think God's heart for you with respect to one of these lists is? That your name would be on there. When you read Revelation, there's going to be a big boat, big, <laughs> easy for me to say, a big book that's opened up and you want your name on that list. You also want your name on these lists. Why? Because God's paying attention. Now, right, is this what God's doing when he's writing his list? About time. <laughs> Been talking to you for years. Jairus, really? He finally made it? Shoot. No. How does, how does God write this list? Man, I see you. <sighs> With joy. Why? Because you're his kid. He's so overjoyed. Man, if you have kids or grandkids, and when they do what you've asked them to do, and you're like, you know, I didn't have to tell them this time. Woohoo! <laughs> Man, that's God's heart for you. God's saying, man, I'd love for your name to be on that list. Here's the question. What's the step for you? What the, he's inviting you. And here's what's it's brilliant what God has done. If we're the kind of people, right, who believe that he's working, that we, we're the kind of people that believe he's working in here and that he's inviting us to take a step with him, it doesn't matter what happens in culture. I don't have time to deal with that. I'm too busy listening to the Father, what he has for me. Seeing him do things, all oh, the culture says, I, really, at some level, I don't care. I'm too busy with what the Father has for me because I care more about this list than whatever's going on in culture at some level. And that's the life you and I want to live. How happy do you think these people were going home? Man. And how happy, how joyful will you be when you are in the midst of what God has called you to do and you know his pleasure and you know his joy over you and you are taking steps in that. That's a life well lived. That's a life well lived. Let's take 30 minutes, take an hour, just sit with your father and be like, okay, God, I believe you. What do you have for me? What do you have for me? Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you're a good God who cares about your kids. And you're doing, um, you are doing, we declare more than we could ask or imagine. But um, you're a dad who invites his kids to participate. And so I just pray for my own heart. I pray for my brothers and sisters that whatever it is that you have for each of us, that we would step into it in this year. And that you would show up to do what only you can do because you are the God who can do the impossible. And so would you do it? Would you fill us afresh, <laughs> fill us afresh by your spirit in order to take the step that we need to take by grace? Because, Father, we believe that you are doing even more than we can imagine. And we want to be a part and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, <clears throat> I'm going to hang out for a little bit. If I can sh take time, shake your hand. I'd like to do that. There's going to be some elders in the back up front. If you need to pray about anything, if you would like an elder to pray, hey, I want to do Ezra 1 and 2, do that. But don't leave this morning without, if that's you, if God's stirring you, okay? Um, it's glad to see you face to face. All right? We're, we're dismissed.